These are in listen only mode. Hello and welcome to our ACCA members. Um, welcome to our webinar today, which is on the tax implications of COVID-19. Now, the business and tax landscape in the Middle East has changed over the last few years and even more so with the impact of COVID-19. These changes are fast moving and affect many businesses across the region. Thank you to our ACCA members for joining our webinar today. Um, we are here with a tax expert. Shiraz Khan is the head of tax and leads Ultamimi's tax practice in the region. He's a UK qualified lawyer with over 15 years of experience and he specializes in advising international tax structuring and tax aspects of cross-border mergers and acquisitions, private equity, structured finance, Islamic finance, and real estate transactions. So if you've got any questions that you would like to ask, please post them in the chat box and we will get, have a question and answer session at the end. Um, I hope you enjoy this session. Looking forward to your feedback. And without further ado, I will now pass on to Shiraz, who's going to talk to you about the tax implications uh, arising from COVID-19. Thank you, Shiraz. Thank you, Fazila. Good morning, everyone. I think the agenda is, is mainly focused on three key questions which a lot of clients and businesses are asking. Uh, I think the very first question is what are the key tax issues and considerations uh, arising uh, from COVID-19 in the Middle East? Um, another question which is a popular question is what, what, what are tax measures are countries and governments and tax authorities taking uh, across the region in response to COVID-19? And finally, a lot of clients are asking how can they better manage their cash flow and manage the tax risks uh, arising out of COVID-19. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the next slide, um, which is focused on the tax issues arising from COVID-19. I know a lot of businesses are focused on cash flow at the moment, which is key. Uh, however, you know, the businesses also have to make sure that they are compliant. And one of the key areas, uh, you know, in addition to cash flow, which is mainly VAT and also customs, is to look at corporate tax and international tax considerations. So as a result of COVID-19, clearly there's been a lot of disruption in businesses. And uh, one of the situations businesses may be facing is that they may have directors uh, who, who are resident in other countries, who are living in other countries, who are coming to the UAE or to the region to conduct board meetings here. Uh, and now, obviously, given the tra travel restrictions and the lockdowns, they're not able to travel. So they're still stranded in their, uh, in their countries. And you may have the reverse situation where directors, for example, are, are based here and were conducting meetings here and they went on holiday to another country and they're stranded over there now. So in the region, you know, where, where tax has really expanded in terms of profile, um, we now have four fully taxable jurisdictions, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, and Saudi. Uh, Bahrain and um, UAE also have limited taxes. And we also have VAT introduced from 2018 and also in 2019 in UAE, Bahrain, and Saudi. Uh, I think the other three countries in the GCC will implement at a later stage. But generally, there's been a misconception that you know there's very limited taxes here because there's free zones, uh, there's no personal income tax, um, th there's also uh, lots of ta tax holidays and incentives available in the region. But like I said, you know, the, the, the tax profile is increasing uh, on, on a regular basis. However, when it comes to corporate tax, most countries in this region, they tax you on a source basis. So you'll only be taxable in those countries where you're generating income in that country. Uh, whereas a lot of the other countries, especially in the West, they don't tax you based on source, they tax you based on residency. So for example, the UK and many other jurisdictions, you're, you're taxed there and your worldwide income if you're resident there. So what does being resident there mean? Essentially it means to so incorporate, if you have a company which is incorporated there, uh, you're resident there, which wouldn't be the case for companies which are registered here already in the region. However, you know, there's a second leg to the residency test where you could be resident in the UK if your central management and control is there. And the same considerations apply to many countries globally. 
so in terms of what central management and control is, that essentially is where the key strategic business decisions of the organization are taken. And typically that is, that is the place where effectively the board meets. So if you have directors who are, who, are, who are initially based here and who have gone to another country and they're stranded in that other country, or otherwise overseas directors who normally come here for meetings, but that they cannot now fly out, there is a risk that you, you effectively, your company over here in the region is tax resident in the other country. Now, what does that mean? As I said, other countries, uh, they tax you on a worldwide basis if you're resident there. Uh, obviously, there's double tax treaties in place uh, which can reduce the exposure and give the taxing rights to one or the other country. However, nevertheless, the risk is there. Now, another issue is the creation of a permanent establishment. Um, you, again, if you've got employees who, who are essentially uh, stuck in another country because of COVID-19, or you had to relocate employees or employees by choice decided to go to their home country uh, because of the lockdowns which were coming and they, they're working from those locations, there's a risk they may actually create a permanent establishment. A permanent establishment essentially means that you have a fixed place of business through which you carry on business. Now, in, when it comes to services, a permanent establishment is normally deemed to exist if your employees on the ground for six or more months. Uh, so you may already have employees in, the, in those countries for three months, four months, and because of the lockdown and the travel restrictions, uh, you've been tipped over the line, which means that you know you, you may have employees for that particular year or for more than six months, which creates a permanent establishment issue. Now, what's the risk of having a permanent establishment? Uh, essentially, if you have a permanent establishment in another country, then you have to file a tax return and you're essentially taxed on your income, which is attributable to that permanent establishment. And uh, again, you know, there's other related issues which arise as a result of the creation of a permanent establishment. So once you, as an organization, have a permanent establishment in another country, and the other country has personal income tax, uh, essentially you, as the employer, may be liable to also register uh, and deduct payroll taxes from the employee's income. So you have to register for uh, corporate tax as a permanent establishment. Uh, you have to file returns, you have to pay taxes. In addition to that, you also have to now deduct income tax from the salaries of your employees. And also, if you have a permanent establishment from a corporate tax perspective, um, potentially you could also have something called a fixed establishment for a VAT perspective. So a, a fixed establishment is generally a place uh, of business uh, where you have sufficient human resources or technical resources to do business. So if you have people on the ground, then you could have, you know, a, a VAT fixed establishment, which requires you to register for VAT uh, and account for VAT on any services or goods that you may provide in that country. So, I mean, there's, like I said, there's a number of uh, risks which arise, uh, you know, as a result of COVID-19. Um, if, if, you, if your directors end up in another country or even your employees end up in the other country. In practice, I think that the risk is low because obviously governments and tax authorities are aware that th these are exceptional cases uh, and it's not on a routine basis. However, nevertheless, the risk is there and you're essentially relying on the mercy of the tax authority in the other country to take the view that because of COVID-19, you're having all these issues and therefore they're not going to take the position that you have, you're a resident there or you have a permanent establishment there. And then the key thing is to monitor the developments. Also economic substance. Uh, you may be aware the UAE and Bahrain recently introduced economic substance regulations. Um, there was a project by the OECD under which the OECD uh, recommended 15 action points, one of them related to harmful uh, tax practices. So if in countries where there's, a, there's no tax or it's a low tax jurisdiction, uh, what they said is that you need to have a minimum level of economic substance um, because otherwise companies would come and establish in those jurisdictions. Uh, and then the EU also created a blacklist uh, and the UAE and the Bahrain were both under Ghana for that reason. Uh, and the UAE, for example, had to introduce economic substance regulations. Uh, and they were initially blacklisted and they were taken off. Uh, so now, obviously, the UAE and Bahrain both have economic substance regulations, uh, and that essentially means that if you have a certain type of activity called a relevant activity, uh, 
then you have to make sure that you have economic, sufficient economic substance in the UAE uh, and also in Bahrain. And that, that really means is that you need to have a core income generating activity. Uh, the company needs to be directed and managed in, in the country locally. Uh, you need to incur certain expenses in the country and you also need to have certain assets in the country. Uh, if you don't comply with these regulations, there are financial penalties, um, your license could be suspended or revoked as well. And there's also a naming and shaming. So the Ministry of Finance over here could actually disclose your details to the Ministry of Finance in the other country. Uh, so I think the key when it comes to COVID-19 is that, uh, as I said, one of the requirements is that for economic substances that you're directed and managed in the country. And uh, usually that means that you need to have at least one board meeting a year in the country. So now, if, because of COVID-19, if your directors are based overseas and they're not able to come here, uh, potentially you could be non-compliant with that requirement. And you have to actually submit a notification and a report as part of this uh, economic substance regulations uh, in order to comply with the regulations. Now, the final, uh, just one final point, actually, obviously the tax authorities or the Ministry of Finance may issue some directives in relation to this uh, and whether uh, these requirements will be impacted when it comes to COVID-19. The final point on corporate tax was transfer pricing. And essentially, transfer pricing, it, it relates to the same issues. So if you have significant people functions in other countries, uh, because of the lockdown, because of the travel restrictions, you've got employees there, you've got higher management in those countries now. So does that mean that you have to allocate and attribute profits uh, to employees in the other country as part of the taxation on the other country? Uh, the other thing is that, you know, as a result of COVID-19, some of your business lines may have discontinued uh, or you may be generally restructuring and reorganizing and making changes to your operating and business model. This will also have transfer pricing implications because you'll already have policies in place uh, based on certain functions, certain risks, certain assets, uh, and that may change now because of COVID-19. So you have to review your transfer pricing policy uh, from that perspective. Now moving on to VAT, uh, which is actually a big one because VAT is all about cash flow. Uh, so VAT is, a, is value added tax, as you know, it applies in the of goods and services and uh, generally is supposed to be tax neutral and the supplier uh, the supplier collects the VAT and it's not a cost to the supplier uh, so essentially the supplier is collecting the VAT on behalf of the government and is remitting the, the VAT on the difference between the VAT collected and the VAT paid so any VAT collected from customers uh, uh, is, is offset against the VAT which is paid to, to suppliers uh, and therefore, in that way, it's tax neutral. Uh, however, as I said, the burden on of complying uh, with VAT and collecting the VAT and accounting for that VAT is on the supplier. And normally, the VAT, the way it's accounted, is on an accrual basis. Uh, so the time of supply is the earlier of the supply happening, which for services is on completion, and which for goods is on the delivery of the goods and otherwise on the issuing of the invoice or the receipt of the payment. Whichever is earlier, uh, you have to account and pay VAT at that time. Normally, most suppliers invoice before they receive payment, so therefore they have to account for VAT at the time they invoice, and they haven't received the payment yet. So that obviously is a big cash flow issue uh, which needs to be managed. And also suppliers, they have to pay, uh, they have to pay their, their suppliers. So on their purchases, on their costs, they have to pay VAT and they have to fund that VAT cost. Uh, so generally it's tax neutral, but it could create a cash flow issue in this way. Uh, so therefore it needs to be carefully managed. I think from a VAT perspective, two key transactions which I wanted to focus on. Uh, the first one is employee related transactions. Uh, so as a result of COVID-19, you know, everyone uh, or a lot of people are now working from home. And as an employer, you may have, um, you, you may instruct the employee to buy some equipment um, and you may want to recover the VAT in relation to that equipment because they're going to use that for work purposes only. Uh, there are some challenges around this. Uh, there should be no output tax liability on them purchasing the actual equipment. Uh, 
But the question is, can you recover, as an employer, can you recover the VAT which has been incurred in respect of that transaction? Now, if the employee is, is keeping hold of the, the equipment uh, which they've purchased at home and they're using it personally, then essentially you need to you need to apportion the VAT which is for their personal use and the and the business use. And you'd only get a deduction and be able to recover the VAT which is attributable to the business use. I think some jurisdictions uh, may also require exclusive use for business. So to the extent that there's, there's some personal use, you may not be able to recover VAT at all. I think a final point is if the employees are purchasing the equipment themselves, uh, then they need to uh, the employer needs to substantiate that it actually relates to the business. Uh, so it generally be preferable if the invoice is issued to the employer. If it's not issued to the employer, then the employer may may not be able to recover VAT. But nevertheless, you need to document the, any evidence to substantiate, you know, the personal use versus the business use, and also uh, that is actually for the purpose of the business. Another related transaction uh, to employees is, you know, as an employer, um, you may have provided them equipment. So in the first case, we were talking about reimbursement of expenses. Uh, in the second case, you've actually provided them equipment, maybe, for example, an office laptop. But and now because they're working from home, they're using that laptop from home. Uh, and of course, there may be some business usage and there may also be some personal usage. Uh, and there's similar issues. So the, essentially, the issue is that you know you may be able to only partly recover the VAT if, if that laptop is actually being used for personal purposes by the employee. Uh, so it's important to monitor it. And um, you know, I think also because if you're providing that laptop to the employee, it's also a potentially a deemed supply. And some VAT legislations they have certain limits. Uh, you know, below which, if, if the good is below these thresholds, then it won't be considered a deemed supply. Uh, but you also have to take that into account. So recoverability on the one side and potentially a supply for, for VAT purposes, which requires you to account for VAT on the provision of the equipment to, 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 the, to your employee. Also, a, a second a transaction uh, which is relevant when it comes to COVID-19 is the cancellation of contracts. Uh, of course, many businesses, um, you know, entered into contracts before COVID-19. They didn't anticipate it, and they fully intended to uh, complete their obligations under the contracts. Whether it was for the supply of goods or the provision of services. But now, with COVID-19 uh, entering the scene, uh, it's actually difficult or almost impossible to complete the contracts. So there's obviously a, a big level of disruption there. Uh, I think the key issue is that in the case of the actual uh, cancellation itself, uh, it should be no, there should be no supply for VAT purposes. So there's no issue there. Uh, where, for example, you've had a customer that's actually paid a deposit or even a, a part payment in advance, you have to consider whether it's a deposit or an advance payment. If it's a deposit, uh, which is refundable, for example, then it won't be a supply for VAT purposes. Uh, on the other hand, if it's an advance payment, it may well be supply. Uh, I, I think the other thing is where you have a contract and you're cancelling the actual contract, uh, that will will not give rise to a VAT issue because there's no supply from a VAT perspective. But because you're cancelling the contract uh, and if you've actually collected some money for it, uh, you may be able you may, you can do an adjustment to the liability. Uh, also, there's an issue on the input side as well. Because generally speaking, in order for you to recover input VAT, uh, it needs to be for the purpose or for an intended taxable supply in the future. Now, if, if you've effectively incurred some VAT uh, and the contract's been cancelled, there's no taxable supply. So this is something you have to bear in mind as well. I think a final point on the cancellation is that sometimes there may be a cancellation fee. Uh, in, in the contract, and it's important to determine the VAT treatment of the cancellation fee. Uh, and the key issue is whether it's a supply or whether it's a compensation. If it's a supply, for example, if essentially a cancellation fee is being charged uh, because the other party is foregoing a right or surrendering a right, then it could be a supply of services for VAT purposes. On the other hand, if it's a, if it's a cancellation fee which is intended to be compensatory in nature, then it shouldn't give rise to any VAT implications.
Now, finally, on the custom side, um, again, you know, COVID-19 has created a lot of disruption uh, in terms of supply chains and in transportation, and, and there's various issues related to that. So previously, maybe you were supposed to receive your, your supplies and imports from China, but that's no longer possible. So you have to change the supply chain where you actually receive them from another country. Uh, so you have, to, you have to actively manage the supply chain uh, to ensure that you could benefit properly from if, the, if, the, if there's any reliefs available and ensure that the goods uh, are received in a timely manner. Also, everyone's working from home and the same is, is the case for many customs officials. Uh, so there may be some de delays in the case of customs clearance. Uh, so ob obviously, if there's any advanced clearance available, you should take benefit of that. And also, if there's any relaxations uh, in terms of cash flow, uh, then you should also try to benefit from that as well. Now, finally, uh, just touching on compliance, uh, clearly, you know, the, if you're registered for tax in, in, in any country in the Middle East, then you're going to have compliance obligations. If you're registered for corporate income tax, uh, you, have, you, ha you have to file tax returns, you have to pay your tax on time. Uh, similarly, for excise tax, VAT, withholding tax, uh, you have to file tax returns on a periodic basis and pay tax on the due dates. Unless, of course, the government has uh, issued some kind of relief which you could benefit from. But if there's no relief there, you still have to comply with, with your tax obligations in a normal way. Uh, many businesses may just assume because of COVID-19, they have an excuse. Uh, that's not the case. So unless the government has actually taken a measure pro proactively, which you're benefiting from, and again, it's important that you meet the conditions of whatever requirements they are, they are there, and wherever conditions there are um, in order to benefit from that relief. Uh, in the absence of that, you're still required to comply with your tax obligations in the normal way. So the situation won't be an excuse for someone who's just not complied because of COVID-19. Uh, so again, you have to keep on top of uh, all, all the me measures which are being taken, which I'm going to move on to in a short while. Exactly the next slide. Now, just uh, in terms of the overview of the um, measures which have been taken, I think many governments uh, across the globe are, have, have provided relief to businesses and incentives for them uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, clearly, they're trying to make sure that the business impact is minimal and they're trying to help businesses along uh, in whatever way they can. And I think some of the measures they've taken have effectively been deferring the tax filing deadline uh, in cases where advance payments are required, uh, removing that requirement temporarily. Uh, in terms of payments, you know, postponing payments uh, to help businesses with cash flow. And also, uh, in some cases, we've seen tax rate reductions, uh, especially for certain sectors which have been really affected by COVID-19, where relief is necessary because of COVID-19. For example, the airlines, restaurants, transport, tourism and medical. Um, in some other countries, we, we've seen VAT exemptions and also other countries have, have responded by suspending tax audits. Uh, and that's all obviously partly related to the fact that a lot of businesses have been disrupted uh, and they're not working from the offices. Uh, and also the tax authorities is the same. Also for, for customs, we, uh, we've seen relief for essential supplies in some countries. Uh, generally, the waiver of penalties as well. Uh, for direct per tax purposes, the measures have actually been more limited, and uh, we've seen some countries actually reduce tax rates. And also, technology has been a big factor as well. So generally speaking, tax authorities are encouraging um, taxpayers to actually deal with them through email or by phone and electronically and avoid personal meetings. So now just moving on to the specific measures taken on uh, by governments in the actual region starting off with the UAE. So the FTA in the UAE, they extended for VAT uh, the filing and payment deadline for monthly and quarterly VAT period, which ended on 31st March. Uh, so originally the 31st March tax return was required to be submitted by the 28th of April. Uh, it's now required to be submitted on the 28th of May, which means that if you're a monthly taxpayer, you have to actually submit two returns uh, on the, on the 28th May, the one related to uh, March and the one related to April. Uh, 
So therefore, there's some additional tax burden there. So although there's a temporary relief, but what you can really benefit from is the actual ta uh, is a payment. So the payment is also being deferred, and that's very very helpful. Similarly, for excise tax, the FTA they've extended the excise tax submission and payment date uh, for the March period for one month. So now the filing and payment deadline for the March April period is 17 May 2020. So effectively, again, two returns are required uh, on, on this date. For economic substance, uh, previously the DIFC and ADGM both said uh, that businesses which are, which are required to comply with economic substance regulations uh, should notify uh, the, the, these authorities uh, whether they're carrying on a relevant activity before the end of March. Uh, now, both of them have retracted that. Uh, the TIFC have now extended this till, till the 12th of June. Uh, the ADGM still hasn't announced uh, any particular date, uh, but it's likely to be before the end of June. Other uh, regulatory authorities, they've also announced dates uh, which are generally around May and June time. So you've got DAFSA, where the deadline is 3 May, and you've got DMCC, Ajman Free Zone, RAC Economic Zone, and RAC ICC, which is 30 June. I think the instructions from the Ministry of Finance are to the regulatory authorities are that they should actually provide notification details to them by 30th of June. So naturally, all the regulatory authorities are expected to uh, ask their businesses to actually notify them before the end of June. Also in, in, in the UAE, there's been some relief from customs as well, and this is on an Emirate by Emirate basis. So in Dubai, for example, you know, th there's 1% custom duty refund on important, imported goods which are sold in Dubai. Uh, there's also cancellation of a 50,000 dirham bank guarantee, which was required to clear the goods in Dubai. And generally, there's been a reduction of 90% in custom clearance fees as well. Um, and also, the Dubai customs are, are now also trying to postpone any audits uh, which were pending. Moving on to Bahrain. In, in Bahrain, no measures have been announced on the extension of the VAT filings and payment deadline uh, or exemption from penalties. So you should file uh, as you would normally. I think earlier in March, the Bahrain uh, NBR, they actually uh, announced where, where in some cases businesses have a file a option to file uh, VAT returns on an annual basis. And you had to actually apply for it before the 29th of March. Uh, and there were some conditions attached to it as well. Uh, so you were required to be resident and uh, not registered as a VAT group. And your annual supplies must be less than $100,000 uh, uh, Bahrain dinars. So provided you meet these conditions and you applied, uh, you'll be able to file one uh, VAT return for the whole year. Uh, however, obviously there's issues with that as well. If you if you file one return, it means that your cash is stuck. And if, if you're in a refund position, you can't really get a refund for one year. So depending on your situation, it may be preferable to you to, to, to not go for this uh, route, which is not no longer possible uh, now anyway. In terms of excise tax, uh, no measures have been uh, announced by Bahrain, and also for cu customs as well, uh, no reliefs have been announced. Uh, for economic substance, uh, Bahrain also extended the notification and deadline uh, from 31st March to 30th of June, which is helpful. Now moving on to Oman. Oman hasn't announced any measures for excise tax, but for corporate tax, uh, they've, they've given an automatic three-month extension uh, for both filing and payment uh, without penalty. Uh, and also, you have to apply for this, but they, they'll give you approval to settle taxes via installments. And also, they, they're giving extensions for objections against tax assessments if the, if the delay is justified at the time of filing. For customs, they've also announced that they're going to clear goods uh, where the um, importer is unable to produce certain documents which were previously required uh, and certain certificates which were required from exporting countries. And they've also waived the requirement to obtain a guarantee uh, for non-submission of original legalized documents which were previously required. In Saudi, there's been a, a lot of measures actually uh, 
uh, Saudi is, is a fully taxable jurisdiction and is, is probably the largest tax jurisdiction in the GCC, so it's no surprise. But they really have uh, gone out of their way to introduce a lot of different types of measures to give relief to businesses. Uh, so for VAT, there's a three-month extension for filing uh, and payment uh, for monthly VAT returns for February, March and May. Um, but that essentially means that you have to file two returns in July, August and September. Uh, what you can do is you could file you could file the return on time to reduce the compliance burden, but you could actually pay later based on the extended deadline. So that will give you the necessary cash flow, uh, but at the same time not overcrowd you when it comes to filing. Similarly, uh, for, for uh, Saudi, for excise tax as well, there's been a three-month extension of the payment and filing deadline uh, related to the March-April period. When it comes to corporate tax, there's, there is also a three-month extension for the payment and filing of corporate tax and cigar returns due between 19 March and 30 June, uh, in addition to approval of installment payment requests as well. And a good thing which, which has happened because of COVID-19, many people had their uh, corporate tax and Sakat certificates for 2019 stuck. Uh, and now because of COVID-19, Gazette started issuing uh, the Sakat and tax certificates automatically uh, to help them renew their licenses, visas, uh, and also receive payments under government contracts. Uh, there's also been for withholding tax a three-month extension uh, for the payment and filing of the returns for the months of March, April and May. Finally, when it comes to penalties, uh, Saudi have, have actually suspended administrative penalties for the late payment uh, for new assessments and for amendments and generally for non-cooperation of taxpayers uh, and voluntary disclosures for corporate tax, VAT and excise tax until 30 June. So this is generally good news. Uh, I think there's an appreciation that you know there's a the, there's a lot of disruption which has happened, which may affect deadlines and your ability to meet them, uh, and therefore the, there's going to be no penalties on these offences until 30 June. And also there's some instructions from uh, Saudi not to seize uh, funds or or stop government services until 30 June as well. Again, you know. When it comes to COVID-19, you may also have some appeal deadlines. And in Saudi, the GSTC, uh, which is the committee which actually manages the tax appeals, uh, has suspended hearings until further notice. And they've also announced that the bank and cash guarantee isn't required until 30 June for objections. Uh, so you can submit objections uh, without security uh, in these cases. Also for customs, so when it comes to customs, uh, there's a postponement of cu a customs duty for 30 days on import of goods uh, for three months against bank guarantee. Uh, there's also the VAT on import of goods has been suspended until 30 June, and the reverse charge mechanism applies. Uh, so you don't have to pay on the import or customs. Uh, you can account for it in the VAT return and, and pay it through the VAT return. Generally, also, there's been a focus on accelerated tax refunds in Saudi. Moving on to Qatar, uh, there's been no ex excise tax measures. Uh, however, the corporate tax filing deadline has been extended by two months to 30 June. And also, when it comes to the QFC, because there's two tax jurisdictions in Qatar, there's a, there's a normal um, uh, jurisdiction, Qatar, and then there's a QFC. Uh, in the QFC, you're, you're allowed to actually apply for an extension of the filing deadline. Uh, so the filing deadline for the, for the 2019 year uh, was the end of June 2020. Uh, so you could actually apply and again it's not automatic, you have to actually apply. So if you don't apply for it, you don't get it and therefore if you don't meet your deadline you're subjected to penalties. So you have to make sure that you you, you uh, proactively apply for this. Qatar has also uh, announced an exemption for, from customs duty on import of essential food and medical items for around six months. Now moving on to Iraq and uh, Kuwait, uh, there's actually been no tax measures are announced in these countries. Uh, I know that a lot of the government offices were shut down and they continue to be shut down uh, for the time being. 
Um, but there's been no announcement even on appeal deadlines. We had a number of clients who were um, who, who were required to appeal by a certain date and their appeal has now been disrupted. The expectation is that of course uh, that hopefully the deadline should be extended because there was no way of making the physical submission and it could only be made physically in these countries in terms of appeals. Uh, but no measures have been announced so far. Egypt. So in terms of Egypt, no VAT measures have been announced in terms of the extension of the VAT return deadline. Uh, however, the taxpayers are essentially required to issue electronic invoices and submit invoices electronically along with the tax returns. For corporate tax, there's no extensions of the filing deadline, uh, but, but there is an extension when it comes to the actual payment. So the corporate tax, which is due for the financial year 2019, um, it, was, it was originally due by the 30th of April. It can now be settled in three installments, where 20% is only required to be paid in May, 30%, sorry, 20% in April, 30% in May, and 50% in June. Uh, but this is only available for certain industry sectors. So it's not available for everyone automatically. Uh, so sectors like aviation, hotels, tourism, media, shipping, transportation, hospitals. Uh, so sectors which have generally been more affected by COVID-19. There's also been some relief for individuals. So individuals income tax red return deadline was extended from 31st March uh, till 16 April. Uh, there's also been some relief for capital gains as well on disposal of listed securities um, and either it's been ex ex exempted or postponed. Also, withholding tax imposed on dividend from listed companies has been reduced from 10% to 5% uh, as, and the stamp duty as well on transactions performed on the Egyptian stock exchange. When it comes to Jordan, uh, Jordan extended the filing deadline for GST for the tax period January and February from 28th March to 30th May. And also uh, the GST on import of food, medicine, certain health related goods and all supplies, uh, local supplies has been postponed until the goods are sold rather than at the time of the contract is signed. Um, also for corporate income tax purposes in Jordan, uh, the filing deadline has been extended from 30 April to 28th of May. Uh, and from, from a customs perspective, uh, there's been no relief as such. However, the customs authorities, they're applying less stringent uh, procedures and inspection formalities, the import of the goods. So now moving on uh, to the final slide, which is focused on managing the tax risk. So I, I think that what I mentioned earlier on in my first slide that you could inadvertently create uh, a risk uh, whether you're resident in, the, in another country um, because your directors are based there and they're conducting board meetings there or otherwise you're sending your people uh, in, in those other countries and they're not able to come back and therefore you have a permanent establishment. If, if you're resident in the other country, you could be taxed on your worldwide income if, you're, if you have a permanent establishment through the presence of employees, uh, you could be taxable in that country on the income arising from that permanent establishment. And you, could also ha you, could you may also be required from a transfer pricing perspective to attribute profits to those employees. Now, like I said, uh, this isn't, the risk of this is quite low. However, unless you have an exception from the authority uh, or there's been some sort of announcement, it's not automatic. So therefore, to manage the risk, I think it's important that you document the positions that as a result of COVID-19, uh, your directors are, are, are taking board meetings in, in the UK or your employees are stuck there. Uh, and this is non-routine and very exceptional. And this would be helpful to present the case before the tax authority, just in case the tax authority doesn't issue any relief and then tries to argue that you're taxable uh, your worldwide income is taxable or you're taxable based on the activities of the employee. In the case of board meetings, you know, if you can limit the participation of the directors which are abroad, uh, that would be better. Or you could even postpone the board meetings as well. 
moving on to the next point, um, corporate tax and VAT. Um, so the, I, I think that, as I explained earlier, when it comes to VAT, uh, as a supplier, you have to account for VAT on the difference between the VAT you've collected from your customers and the VAT you've paid uh, to, to your suppliers. And generally speaking, in your VAT return, normally in, in normal circumstances, the output VAT, which is the VAT you've collected from your customers, should be more than the input VAT. Uh, but now the situation is different. Given COVID-19, uh, many companies, they're not operational and therefore they're not really generating revenues. So it's quite easy to find yourself in a position where the VAT you've actually paid on your costs exceeds the VAT that you've collected from your customers. And therefore you're in a refund position. In, in most countries, you could actually you could actually offset the VAT you've incurred against the uh, VAT you've collected, and where, where there's a difference, you could actually get a refund from the tax authorities. Uh, but the refund it, it may not be automatic. There may be some requirements. Uh, there may be some documents you have to produce. So you have to make sure that the house is is in order, and you have all these documents, and you're able to efficiently process the invoices. So I think in the past. Um, in order to recover VAT, you have to collect invoices from your suppliers, but maybe there was a bigger timeline in terms of collecting these invoices. It may be worth sort of expediting that and making sure you have all the invoices from your suppliers to enable you to recover the VAT, because this may be requested as part of the refund application. So just becoming more efficient in terms of managing the invoicing process and just making sure that you know you could expedite it and present it to the tax authority. Uh, also, uh, where, where uh, a refund is relevant is withholding tax. Um, so generally speaking, as a non-resident, if you're operating in one of these countries in the, in the region, uh, you may be subject to withholding tax in that country. And it may be that you're entitled, it may be that you're entitled to a refund, it may be that you're entitled to a refund of withholding tax uh, under a treaty, so because the withholding tax was deducted in contravention of the treaty. Uh, however, the, again, there's a process uh, which you have to follow. You have to have certain documentation in place. Uh, so just making sure that you benefit from that. In our experience, many companies, they actually just take the withholding tax hit, uh, even though there's a treaty and they could get relief under the treaty. In some circumstances, you could actually get treaty relief in advance, which is even better because then if you present that to your to, to your customer, then they won't deduct withholding tax from you. Now, in terms of VAT, there's a number of measures here, you know, which could help uh, you, you your cash flow position, which is critically important right now. Uh, the first one is bad debt relief. Uh, so again, you have to account for VAT at the time you issue invoice to your customer. You may not of received point payment at that time. So you've already paid the VAT, but you don't have any money from your customer and your customer may not pay you. And you know because of the situation, it may be that they delay their payment or they, they never pay you because maybe they don't, they don't exist anymore. Uh, so in these cases, under normal VAT rules, you'd be able to get bad debt relief. Uh, so the VAT that you've, you've previously paid, you can make an adjustment later on and effectively get a deduction from the VAT. Uh, so recovering that VAT you've previously paid. But there are conditions attached to this. Um, in the UAE, for example, you know, if you have to write off the, the amounts and the debt has to be outstanding for six month period. Um, in, in the KSA, uh, and also you have to notify the customer of the write off as well in the UAE. In the KSA, the, the, the period the debt has to be outstanding is 12 months. Uh, again, you have to write off in the accounts uh, and you also need a certificate from the from a chartered accountant that has been written off. And in cases where the, the amount's more than 100,000 uh, Saudi rials, you actually need to, uh, sh you need to demonstrate that you actually try to collect the money. So initiated legal procedures uh, and instigated legal proceedings against this customer to collect the amounts. In Bahrain, uh, similarly to Saudi, it's a 12 month period. Uh, you need to write off in your accounts. Uh, you just need to prove that you've taken measures to collect. So emails and, and calls uh, to, to your customers sh showing that you're trying to collect the money from them uh, may be sufficient. Maybe you don't have to go uh, to the extreme of initiating legal proceedings in the same way as Saudi. The legislation is a little bit vague on that. 
moving on to the next point, uh, amending contractual payment terms. Uh, of course, many people, they have contracts in place for the supply of goods and services, and there's also payment terms under the contract. Uh, and it may be worthwhile amending these contracts, if possible, to re re reduce the payment terms, meaning that you receive the payment uh, you know, earlier than you were supposed to, which will help your cash flow situation. Uh, another way of, of dealing with this issue could be to actually have payment in advance. So if typically you are collecting payment from the customer at the end of the contract, when the contract is completed, uh, you could maybe collect payment in stages uh, based on certain milestones or even collect a 10%, 20% in advance, uh, which will help your cash flow situation. Also in terms of uh, general cash flow planning, um, you know, there's there certain things you could do to help uh, a position. Now, you have to collect VAT, uh, you know, for services when the services are completed or when the goods are supplied. Uh, and normally, strictly speaking, whenever you've made the supply, uh, in Saudi, you're required to uh, issue a tax invoice within 15 days. Uh, and also in, in Bahrain, 15 days of the following month. In UAE, I think it's around 14 days. But what you can do in cases where you've got continuous supply. So you, you, if it essentially supply made on a periodic basis or the invoices are being issued on a periodic basis, in, in that case, you could actually issue a pro forma invoice. And essentially, uh, in, the, in that case, in that case you, you won't need to account for VAT on that pro forma invoice. And then what other time you receive the payment, then you could actually issue the tax invoice at that time. You know, in some of these, uh, in, in the legislation of some of these countries, there's actually nothing preventing you from doing that for continuous supplies. But obviously, if you've already completed the service or you've supplied the goods, then you are under an obligation to issue the tax invoice within a certain period of time, which itself will trigger an obligation to account for VAT. Right? But this is only for continuous services where essentially the services has or the supply of goods has not been completed the goods haven't been supplied but it's, it's, it's a small tactic you could actually use um, I think on the on the other hand uh, and this is conversely um, if you've got a long tax period and you may want to consider invoicing early in the tax period to allow you to collect uh, the money uh, before the end of the tax period uh, but if you're if you're not confident uh, based on the customer then obviously it wouldn't be advisable Another possibility is um, in many of these countries, you could actually extend the tax period. So normally you would have been allocated a tax period uh, from the ta tax authority. Uh, you may apply to extend the tax period as well or reduce it based on your circumstances. And again, there's a different approach uh, in different countries. Uh, also, what you may consider is a VAT grouping. So you may have a number of entities in a group and all, all of the entities are separately registered for VAT. Now, if you if you register as one VAT group, essentially all the transactions between the group entities are ignored for VAT purposes. And this is something that you may want to benefit from. Many people already have, but there's some groups that haven't um, actually taken up this initiative and it's resulting in a big VAT cost. And obviously it's best to manage uh, the, this, this tax issue. When it comes to customs, uh, again, you have to assess uh, the supply chain impact. Your, your supply chain may be disrupted and previously you were receiving supplies from a certain country and now you're receiving them from them from another country. Uh, so obviously you have to assess uh, whether there's any free trade, trade agreements in place which you could benefit from because the relief often depends on origin. Uh, and sometimes, you know, depending on the origin, there could be a higher rate also. Uh, I think the key thing is because of these changes in supply chain, you have to monitor, uh, you know, these changes. You have to review them, and you also have to review how what the impact of these changes is as well. And also in the GCC, um, if you, if you have intra GCC supplies, they shouldn't be subject to customs because the GCC has a common customs law under which the first supply in the GCC is subject to, uh, to customs at the first point of entry. So any subsequent movements of goods should not be subject to customs. However, this isn't automatic and you need to have certain documents in place. You need to meet certain conditions uh, and therefore it's not very straightforward. Uh, 
also, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of customs officials, uh, they're working, uh, you know, on, on a limited basis. So if, if you can apply for pre-clearance pre and if you could do things electronically, which would fast track the clearance, uh, you should benefit from that. Sorry, the next one is availing tax reliefs. Uh, and as I discussed in the previous slide, uh, a number of countries uh, have adopted uh, different measure, different types of measures to give relief to businesses because of the issues they're facing from COVID-19. So it's important to monitor these changes and keep track of them on a regular basis and see if you could benefit. And in some cases, the benefit will be automatic. In other cases, as you've seen, you have to actually make an application or you have to submit some documentation. So keeping abreast of that, you know, whether you could benefit from them and then making sure that you comply with all the requirements in order to benefit. Also in, in the KSA, for example, this, 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 and this isn't linked to COVID-19, um, but, you know, could be helpful as well. Uh, so the Saudi tax authority, Gazette, on the 1st of January, they issued some sort of amnesty uh, for customs purposes. So if you've made errors in your customs declarations, import declarations for the past five years, uh, if you make a voluntary disclosure of these errors, uh, there'll be no penalties uh, for a six month period. So you've got until the end of June, this may be something worth benefiting from because the penalties can be quite substantial as well. I think uh, I think that that was it. So it's important again to to comply with all the requirements which have been set by the authority, and first of all, know what the requirements are to benefit. Now, the final point I wanted to make is that you know, in terms of compliance, you still need to manage the compliance risk. So clearly, COVID nineteen uh, has been a big issue. It's caused major disruption in businesses. Uh, maybe your tax department or your tax team, you know, they're working from home and they're not able to do everything they can do. Uh, and that therefore is affecting your ability to comply uh, with, 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 with obligations under the tax laws. But as I mentioned, it's not an excuse for not complying. Uh, you need to consider your capacity, the resourcing of your tax compliance team. And um, obviously it creates a lot of pressure, but ultimately the tax authorities uh, they, they focus on compliance. So unless they've issued specific relief or they've extended a deadline, extended the payment deadline, uh, they, they won't be very, very um, uh, favorable for people who are non-compliant deliberately. Uh, and again, you know, going forward, it's, it's going to create a big issue. As you've seen, oil and gas prices are reducing, uh, which means that the tax revenue of businesses is going down. And in turn, the ta tax revenue of tax authorities will go down. And the authorities in the region are generally focusing on diversification, uh, so they, they effectively want to rely on tax revenue as an independent source of revenue, helping them diversify the revenue streams. And therefore, after the COVID-19 situation is, uh, is over, you could expect um, you know, some more activity from the tax authority in terms of audits uh, and in, even potentially in terms of changes in rates. Uh, so I know the VAT rate is fixed at the GCC level and has been at that level for the past two years now, third year now, um, but uh, that could change in the future, although technically speaking, um, agreement will be required at the GCC level. Uh, but the ultimate message is if, if you don't comply, uh, then you're liable and the tax authorities will go after you. And it's important to get your house in order now because you can expect increased activity after the lockdowns are lifted and after the uh, initial period is over. So I'm going to uh, pass it over to Fazila now, who, who, who will let me know if there's any questions. Right, thank you for that, um, Shiraz. I am, I'm sure we've got about around nearly about 185 people online, and I'm sure they found that very useful. I do have some questions to ask you. Um, right, some of them might not be phrased properly, but I'm sure you and I will be able to pick up what it's trying to say. Um, has the UAE government announced any tax payment waiver since cash flow is a huge problem in the current situation? That's a good question. I mean, as I was discussing earlier, uh, the UAE government has announced, uh, you know, in terms of tax payment and also tax filing for excise tax and for VAT. Uh, so they have only for one month period. Uh, 
So in right. the case of VAT, it's been extended from 30, uh, if you were essentially for your 31st March period, whether it's quarterly or monthly, and originally you were required to pay by 28th April, that's now been extended to 28th May. And mm -hmm. similarly for excise tax for the March April period, you know, uh, it's in, essentially it's been extended to 17 May. Okay. All right, great. I hope that answers the question for who asked that. Um, is there any change in tax submission in Iraq for CIT extension due to COVID-19? Yeah, that's that's a good question. As I mentioned <laughs> earlier, in in Iraq, uh, there's actually uh, there's, there's been no concessions from the tax authorities, and the tax authorities themselves have been under lockdown. So uh, th th there's been no concession so far, but th that could change later. And uh, obviously, you need to make sure that you're compliant. Um, in the event that you're not compliant, obviously, you could document the situation and see whether you could leverage that later on. But again, you know, it, 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 you'd be relying on it as an excuse. There's no guarantee the tax authorities would accept that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, reference to economic substance. Where can we get more details, such as deadline, time to submit, information to report to those authority, and who all want to submit in the UAE? Yeah, that's a good. I mean, there's no centralized source. Obviously, the Ministry of Finance are managing economic substance, uh, but essentially, the notifications and the reports have to be submitted by uh, to your regulatory authority, which could be DFC, ADGM, DAFSA, depends on the authority. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's no central uh, space where you could find information. But each each regulatory authority should should be expected to uh, issue more detailed instructions on on the notification. I think some of the ones I mentioned have already uh, announced that notification is required in May or June, and I think the reasonable expectation is that all of them would be required. You'd be required to notify to all regulatory authorities before the end of June, because they in turn have a requirement to notify the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. In terms of reporting, you know, it's 12 months, uh, you know, for 2019 year end. So mm -hmm. the first report, the first reporting should be required by the end of this year. But there's a lot of work to be done as well. It's not just about uh, notifying and and then submitting a report. Before you submit your report, the, you know, and the notification, they need to be focused on the fact that you're compliant, and maybe you're not compliant. So there's a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of reorganizing, restructuring your operations and activities to become compliant, because obviously the consequences are quite grave. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Shiraz. What about, is there any news available on the introduction of VAT in Oman, Qatar and Kuwait? Um, there, there's, there's no news at the moment, no official announcements. Uh, Qatar and Oman were expected to issue VAT at some point last year, but they didn't. Uh, and then, you know, the expectation was they that they would this year, uh, but that's unlikely to happen now. So I think that Obviously, all GCC countries have agreed to implement VAT, and my personal expectation is that Qatar and Oman will do it next year. Qatar had some, um, you know, some political issues around that, and in terms of Oman, uh, there was there were some um, practical hurdles as well. Uh, but both countries are expected to introduce VAT uh, in 2021, uh, and uh, Qatar, for example, has everything in place. They have the regulations, they have the infrastructure. So it's just a question of when they want to decide to go ahead. And in Kuwait, uh, you know, there was some reluctance uh, in the past from the parliament. Uh, so they initially said they're postponing postponing the introduction of VAT to 2021, and it may be postponed further now. Okay, so look out for that. Um, what if an entity operation has been closed because of COVID-19? How should we file deregistration with FTA in the UAE? Uh, in terms of deregistration, there's a there's a process and there's an application that you can make online. And also, you have to you obviously have to settle any VAT which is outstanding. Uh, or if you're in a refund position, um, it can be quite complicated because if you're in a refund position, uh, you you effectively have to clear that refund before you get deregistered. Um, and it, it can be it can take some time. 
I mean, I, I know there's probably quite a lot of questions and I'm happy to take questions on email as well if uh, if we don't have sufficient time now, so. Yep, I think we'll do one more because we have run out of time. It's um, exactly an hour since we started. Um, do you believe extension of one month on VAT is enough? Uh, obviously, the longer the extension, uh, the better it is. And uh, yeah, you know, one yeah. month is better. It's one month is better than nothing. But, nothing. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's better than nothing. So they didn't have to, and obviously, it's a nice gesture, and it can potentially be extended as well. So let's see. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was an initial announcement, and depending on how the situation develops, and that's why it's important to monitor any announcements by the tax authorities because the situation could change as we go on. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, right, I think that brings us to the end of the session. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Shiraz. Um, we are, as ACCA, going to be working with Al Tamimi going forward this year on our VAT tax agenda. Um, hopefully, when the situation resolves, we'll have some face-to-face -face events happening across the region, which we all look forward to. Um, Thank you to our ACCA members, many of them who have joined this session today and many more who will be listening to this recording. Um, if you have any further questions, then please feel free to drop us an email at middleeastaccaglobal.com and we'd be happy to get um, to see if Shiraz would be able to answer your questions. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Shiraz. And until next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.